Welcome everyone to the ABRF virtual sequencing seminar series. Um, we hope you've enjoyed participating in the series. This is our penultimate program. We'll have one more session uh, next week. And, but today we're pleased to be joined by Singular, Cellu Singular Genomics. Uh, and I just wanna go over a couple of quick announcements from ABRF uh, before we turned over and you can enjoy their presentation. So um, ABRF has some, so just as housekeeping, if you'd like to, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, the name where you're connecting to us from and your institution. If you have questions, once again, use the chat function and our speakers will take those questions either in between uh, sessions of the program or at the end. As you heard, today's session is being recorded and everyone will receive the recording tomorrow. It'll also be linked uh, on the ABRF website together with the recordings of the other programs in the series. And just to make a quick mention of upcoming events, as I said, we have one more in this series, same time, same uh, uh, day next week, Tuesday, excuse me, uh, at two o'clock. And then we wanted to help you mark your calendar for the ABRF annual meeting, which will be next May, seven to 10 in Boston. Registration for the meeting, attendee registration will open on October 31st, which is about 10 days from now. Sponsor registration is already available, so don't miss out if you'd like to be joining us as a sponsor for next year. So with that, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Darius uh, at Singular to kick things off for us. Darius? Yeah. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Ken and Anoja, for having us. Uh, we're, we're very excited to be talking to the ABRF community today. Uh, so I am Darius Fugere. I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing here at Singular Genomics, and I'm joined uh, in the room, actually, by Martin Fabani. Uh, he's our Vice President of Sequencing Applications. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about the G4. So I'm going to go in uh, with a, a couple slides um, introducing Singular Genomics. Uh, and then introducing the platform itself, hopefully giving you relevant information. And then Martin's going to talk about some of the exciting uh, information, a lot of the data that we're generating off the G4 and, and various applications that might be of interest uh, to you. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Singular Genomics was, was founded in, in 2016, really with the mission of developing disruptive genomic solutions to accelerate the ex advancement of science and medicine. Uh, and five years later, we uh, now are a publicly traded company uh, based in San Diego, California. We have about 270 employees uh, and have raised about $450 million to date, um, of which we have about you know, 300 million in, in uh, reserves. So very uh, capital efficient uh, and uh, I think in a very strong financial position to support our many customers moving forward uh, for the long term. We have uh, over 135,000 square feet of, of manufacturing R&D and office space uh, kind of across from, from Torrey Pines area. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I think importantly, we've been uh, in an R&D uh, innovation engine. Uh, you know, we have 140 issued and pending patents protecting all of our, our technologies um, that, that we've, we've brought forward. Uh, Drew and Eli uh, founded the company here in, in the middle. Uh, and then they brought on a highly experienced leadership team of industry veterans. Uh, we have a very strong board of directors and a scientific advisory board of uh, genomic, genomics experts, um, some of which you might be familiar with. Uh, and then we've been developing two products. So the, the G4, uh, which we're going to be talking about today, this is fast, flexible, and scalable next generation sequencing. Uh, we also have in development the PX platform. This is uh, high throughput, spatial, and in situ single cell analysis, uh, something that we think will be very disruptive, uh, and we're very excited to bring forward, um, but not something that we're, we're going to be focusing on today. If there is interest from anyone in the audience, certainly reach out to our field team. We're happy to uh, talk a little bit more in detail. Um, but moving on with, with the G4, uh, when Drew and Eli started the company, uh, you know, they, uh, the first thing they did was go out and talk to about 40 different labs and, and lab directors. Uh, and a lot of those actually were, were core labs. So potentially uh, some of you listening in today um, had the chance to speak with them. And they, they asked, um, you know, what are, what are your biggest challenges with sequencing? What innovations would you like to see in a platform moving forward? And what they heard 
time and time again was people wanted faster sequencing, they wanted more flexible sequencing, and they wanted cost efficient sequencing. So in order to, to solve that problem, you need to think about it more holistically. So one of the challenges with sequencing today uh, is that uh, you have a very long period of time in which you need to accumulate samples uh, to be able to run, uh, fit them on a flow cell and run in a cost efficient manner. Uh, library prep has gotten pretty fast. I think uh, you know li the library prep companies have done a great job in, in reducing the time of their workflows. Sequencing certainly needs some room for improvement. A lot of the mid throughput systems have you know over uh, you know two to three day run times. And then uh, on the analysis front, that is that is very fast. We're seeing companies like Nvidia that have um, accelerated bioinformatic pipelines, uh, you know, with with their GPUs. So. There are room for improvements. So when we think about bringing faster um, and more cost-efficient sequencing, you need to address uh, these two uh, items. On the sequencing side, uh, you know, you need advancements in uh, the optical system, the microfluidics, and the chemistry. They all need to be much faster. That reduces the sequencing runtime. And on the sample accumulation side, you need flexibility. So this is the ability to run smaller batch sizes more frequently in a cost efficient manner. And only by addressing both of these can you really make a substantial improvement in time to answer uh, for, for most projects. You know, innovations to enable this uh, need to be multifaceted and, and take place across uh, many different disciplines. Uh, so starting with, uh, you know, nucleotide chemistry, um, and all of the innovations that need to happen there to enable you know, faster cleaving, um, more rapid nucleotide incorporation, uh, and just a, a, a completely uh, redeveloped uh, SBS chemistry from the ground up to enable two and a half minute cycle times. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, and, and that's just the start. So accompanying the, the chemistry and improvements that the team here has, has made, uh, you have uh, flow cell design, sequencing applications, systems integration, optical, mechanical, electrical engineering, uh, software firm, firmware, high-performance computing to be able to process a billion pixels per second, uh, and bioinformatics. And all of these functions need to come together uh, to bring forward a, a disruptive solution that addresses those challenges. And I'm happy to say uh, we have the G4 as a result of those efforts. This is the world's most powerful benchtop sequencer. And when we talk about power, um, we think about it as the data uh, that's coming off of the system. So the amount of data that's coming off the system at any point in time. Uh, and you can measure this by uh, data per day or gigabases per day, millions of reads per day, or the way I like to think about it, the amount of samples you can process per year. Uh, so we have 15 to 400 gigabases of output um, per run. And that's accompanied by faster run times. So we have six to 19 hour run times. Um, this uh, allows us to have overnight sequencing across all applications. Uh, and then flexibility of the system, really solving that sample accumulation problem that I was talking about. We have uh, the capability to process one, two, three, or four flow cells at a time. Uh, and each of those flow cells that are shown here on the right, they have 16. Uh, each flow cell has four fluidically independent lanes, uh, so you can have 16 lanes per run. And then, of course, accuracy is, is table stakes. Um, uh, so we have between 75 and 90 percent of bases greater than Q30. I think we routinely see in the you know in the mid 80s, uh, and that's really enabled by the the novel four color rapid SBS chemistry we we've developed. And Martin will talk through a lot of the the performance there. Uh, I'm just going to show a couple of graphs here that, that kind of uh, indicate how those performance metrics stack up against other systems that, that are available. Uh, so when we think about power, what I'm showing here is the, uh, a comparison uh, for the NextSeq 2000, the VD system, and the G4. And this is mapping out uh, the max gigabases that you can produce uh, per day. Uh, so you can see that we're, we're roughly equivalent to, uh, you know, one element, uh, a VD system, and uh, one NextSeq 2000 combined in terms of the power output. We have, uh, you know, run times of, of 19 hours for two by 150. So we look at speed to process 300 cycles or a two by 150 run. 
uh, and other systems are at about a 48 hour runtime. So substantial improvements in, in runtime itself. And then flexibility, there's different ways that you can measure a flexibility of a system. Uh, you can look at the number of flow cells you can process simultaneously in this first column. You can look at the unique run sizes that you can press start on the system with. Uh, that would be in the second column. Uh, so we have between two different flow cell sizes and four positions. We have eight different um, run sizes that you can start uh, the system with. And you can look at the number of lanes. Uh, so you know, it's up to 16 lanes per run. So I think by any measure of, of flexibility, I think we have a significant advantage over other systems. Uh, another important aspect uh, to bringing a, a system forward is that it needs to slot in to existing ecosystems. So we've been very active in partnering with uh, leading library prep providers. Um, uh, so we've been, been partnering with all the major library prep companies to showcase compatibility um, of our adapters with their workflows. These really are uh, plug and play uh, with, with uh, minimal to no impact at all to upstream library preparation. Uh, or uh, you can have a simple PCR conversion that takes place from an existing library. Uh, the sequencing itself, uh, really important for this uh, to be adaptable by the uh, personnel that you, you already have um, uh, in your lab. So this is uh, very simple to load. Uh, we've got a, a really nice user interface that walks you through the process in order of, to start a run, monitor a run, can get your results off. Uh, we also have an off instrument management application. Uh, and then all of our consumables have electronic IDs for nice um, inventory management uh, and, and traceability. Uh, and then actually what, what's a nice little feature um, that you'll, you'll see if you get to demo this at, at a conference or come uh, to Singular and see the systems, uh, each flow cell actually has magnetic snap in. So there's really nice uh, haptic feedback um, from, from the system itself. Uh, so I think little, little bits of uh, you know, of good design work uh, that went into making this a, a very high quality and user friendly system. Uh, and then on the analysis front, we uh, we produce demultiplex fast queue files um, as a result of, of the, the sequencing. Uh, and then these can be plugged into any downstream bioinformatic pipelines. Uh, we've also been working with various platforms like the Terra, like Broad's Terra platform and NVIDIA. Uh, in order to accelerate analyses, um, and then working with various cloud providers to um, uh, to store uh, data off the system and, and directly pipe pipe data off the system into those storage solutions. Uh, so really plug and play with any downstream bioinformatic pipelines that you might be using today. On the reagents, we have two different flow cell sizes. Uh, you're looking at the F2 flow cells. These have you know, 150 to 165 million reads each. Uh, keep in mind, you can fit four flow cells per run. So multiply that by four to get a system level output. Uh, we have 100, 200, and 300 cycle configurations. And then the run times of those uh, range between eight and 19 hours, uh, depending on, on how many cycles you use. And then the F3 flow cells have between 300 and 330 million reads. Uh, you know, and, and we actually have a 50 cycle Okay, configuration that we've in, we've introduced there. So you have run times between six and nineteen hours. Uh, so really providing maximum flexibility uh, to give you additional cost savings and time benefits depending on the application. And then max reads uh, something that we've been developing a, a unique methodology here that Martine will talk through. Uh, this is allowing us to process up to a billion reads per flow cell for short uh, counting applications. Uh, so that's 4 billion reads per run, and run times there are about 24 hours. Uh, important for, for any system coming forward uh, that it's highly versatile um, to address the variety of applications that, you know, customers might see on a, on a daily basis or weekly basis. Um, so we have kind of here just shown, you know, RNA gene expression or, or small RNA. RNA sequencing, single cell, exome, target enrichment, whole human genome, you know, the relevant run times, and then the number of samples you can fit on a single F2 flow cell, a single F3 flow cell, or you know, at the at the high end, how many samples you can fit on a, a full up F3 run. And I think it's important that you can scale throughout these um, 
for even from the very low end all the way up to the very high end with very minimal uh, price difference uh, at a cost per sample basis. So I think this is really important to keep in mind. This is the, that flexibility and cost efficiency to run you know, your, your experiments um, through bite-sized intervals or flow cells that we have available. Uh, and we've been working to validate these uh, these applications um, and the performance of them. I won't go into any any detail here because Martine's gonna gonna cover this um, in much greater detail than I possibly could. Uh, but we do have application notes available on our website. Uh, we've also generated a lot of data with third party collaborators. Uh, we ran a, an early access program, installed the system across seven sites, generated data with those those uh, companies or, or institutions, and, and most of them actually went, went forward and purchased the system. Uh, so excited to bring forward data in, in collaboration with those. A couple, uh, couple of those are shown, shown here and also available on the website. Uh, pricing, I think this is something that a, a lot of uh, you might be interested in. On the instrument side, uh, looking at $350,000 list price, uh, we do offer volume-based discounting, um, but I think it's worth keeping in mind uh, when looking at the price that 1G4 um, is basically able to process the same number of samples uh, to one AVD system and one next seat combined. Uh, so I think there's a, a lot of opportunity to scale up a single system that uh, should be calculated here. And then we do have flexible financing uh, options. So leasing uh, and, and some other creative solutions encourage you, if you are interested in the system, to reach out to our our sales team, and, and I'm sure we can work with you in your specific scenario to, to make something work out. On the reagent side, we have 600 to $1,000 flow cells. What uh, that means is we're, we're down to $150 lanes. We're, I think, really excited to be able to offer that to you. Um, and I think hopefully that that's uh, able to translate over um, into services that you may be able to provide to your, um, your customers. Uh, you know, down to a dollar per million reads with with max reads as that comes forward for select counting applications. Uh, and then, you know, eight dollars to, to ten dollars as, as a price per gigabase. Um, something I typically don't like to refer to to price per gigabase because I think when um, other companies do this, it's not necessarily reflective of the price that the customer ends up paying because you need to be running those flow cells at, at optimal efficiency. Um, so I, I do have a couple of slides kind of showcasing the cost savings as a result of the, the eight different run sizes we have. Um, and we think this actually results in practical cost savings for your typical experiments for daily utilization of the platform. And one way to visualize this uh, is, uh, is something like this. So you have the, the G4, which is shown on the left, and you've got, you know, in this case, the uh, NextSeq 2000 shown on the right. Uh, what I'm, I'm showing here is uh, the reads required to process a given number of samples on hand. Um, so you accumulate samples over time. At any given point in time, you want to run those. Uh, these would be the reads required. And then uh, on the bottom uh, or the x-axis, you're looking at flow cell configurations or run sizes. Um, so we have eight different run sizes that you can press go on the system with. Uh, so in, for instance, this would be one F2 flow cell, this would be one F3 flow cell, this would be an F2 and an F3 flow cell, and so on and so forth. Um, and then on the y-axis, you're looking at reads delivered. So whenever you process a, a sample um, or a set of samples or project, you have um, utilized flow cell space. Hopefully this is um, highly efficient and you're utilizing most of your flow cell space, um, but inevitably you will have some unused uh, space. Uh, and I think when you have large flow cells, uh, you have a, a bigger chance of having a lot of unused space that that translates to, um, you know, a lot of, of costs that you end up accumulating as a result. Uh, so I'm going to go through a, a couple examples here um, of some, you know, kind of typical project sizes that um, labs might experience, you know, and maybe these are daily on a daily basis. Um, but just to kind of give you guys an understanding of, of the cost savings that you can see just purely as a function of the flexibility and being able to run uh, smaller batch sizes. Uh, so if you were to process, you know, eight uh, micro RNA uh, samples, uh, you know, that need about 10 million reads each, uh, you'd be looking at using a, a single F2 flow cell. Um, you know, if you were to run that on, you know, the next seek 2000, uh, that you're looking at using their P1 uh, flow cell. 
uh, and in our, in our case, we have a hundred cycle kit. So that's what's calculated here. And, and the P, uh, P1 flow cell is a 300 cycle kit. Uh, but you can see that your uh, price per sample is $75 per sample in this case versus 156. Uh, and you've got some time savings as well. Uh, slightly larger project size, if you were to process eight exomes that require 30 million reads each, again, two by uh, 100, so maybe a 200 cycle kit configuration. Uh, on the G4, you're looking at you know, fitting this on one F3 flow cell. Um, on an XC2000, this would be on a, a P2 flow cell. Uh, and you know, in, in this case, uh, it's $110 a sample on the G4 versus uh, you know, three times that on, on the next seek 2000 and then one more, uh, you know, if you were to even scale up a little bit larger, you've got 16 transcriptomes that you'd like to process uh, with 50 million reads each. Um, in this case, this would be one, two, three F3 flow cells run together. Uh, and you'd be looking at $165 per sample uh, versus 288 on uh, the next C2000 and, and half of the runtime. So I think what's what's important to keep in mind is the scalability of the system and the ability to process uh, one, two, three, or four flow cells across eight different run sizes allows you to keep your cost per sample down even as you scale down experiment sizes. So we have a relatively um, you know level cost curve. Uh, and I just want to say you know this this really isn't solved by other systems that have have recently come to market. Um, you know, and just to, to be fair, I'm showing reads able to be delivered in, in a 48 hour window now because you can run the G4 twice uh, for a two by 150 run in, in 48 hours. Uh, so you can have, in this case, 16 different cost points on the G4. And if you look at, you know, the VD system, you're trying to fill up two very large flow cells uh, with a billion reads each. Uh, and there's just not much inherent flexibility in that. So you end up paying a much higher price per sample or you're just waiting a lot longer to accumulate uh, enough samples to run those in a cost efficient mode. So I, I typically don't like to refer to price per gigabase because really that's only looking at these top right corners in which you're using a flow cell uh, to 100% efficiency uh, versus practical cost savings um, by looking at you know, flow cell price and, and, uh, and usability thereof. Uh, so if you are considering a G4, I think important to kind of look at the quality and manufacturing. Uh, our leadership team has an extensive medical device background, and this is echoed through our quality management system, supply chain, manufacturing processes. Um, so we have an ISO 9001 compliant framework with a planned transition to ISO 13485. Uh, we have in-house manufacturing of all of our critical chemistry components uh, and really building up our supply chain to support rapid scale up, uh, many, many customers, and we have critical items inventoried for multiple years out. And then similarly on the G4, everything is assembled entirely in-house um, and we've got the space and expertise to be able to uh, build systems for, for years to come uh, without needing to get more. So if you were to pick up a G4 today, what, what would it look like? Uh, we have risk-free acquisition models. Uh, so this is, uh, invoicing only after on-site validation of the instrument performance meets agreed upon specifications. Uh, we have uh, white glove installation and support. We have a very high caliber uh, service and support team that does on-site training, uh, instrument uh, performance ver validation. Um, we'll have rapid response time and preventative maintenance. Uh, we have two-year warranty uh, you know, for those that will order by the end of the year. Uh, that includes qualified reagent replacements, uh, instrument replacements, repairs, and updates uh, to hardware and software. And then lots of opportunities to innovate and share um, for joint data demonstration, helping uh, our, our customers showcase their results to, uh, to their end users. Um, so uh, certainly looking for uh, lots of collaborative partners in, in that capacity. Um, and then I just, you know, I'd like to end by, by welcoming anyone that is considering a platform and happens to be in San Diego. We'd love to host you on site. Uh, you can come see the G4s in action. You can, you can work with them directly yourself um, and, and get a chance to meet the team. Uh, so uh, with, with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your time. And I'm going to hand it uh, actually right across the table to uh, Martine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're good now. Uh -huh. So let me share my part of the presentation. 
Let's put it in presentation mode. All right, can you see it? All right, so it's a real pleasure to, to talk to you all today. My name is Martin Falani. Um, I'm the Vice President of Sequencing Applications here at Singular. I'm really excited to share some data uh, and some fun things about the G4 to you all. Um, this is a little agenda for, for my portion of the presentation. I'll be talking about library prep for the G4, a little bit about the instrument itself and how to start runs. I'm sure many of you are wondering how to uh, how to interact with the instrument. And then we're gonna move into, into, into data, talk a little bit about data quality, uh, grid quality, GC coverage, um, maybe a little index hopping information, how to deal with low diversity libraries, and then some more specifics on some uh, very common applications that we found G4. So let's start with library preparation. You know, in a previous life, uh, I worked at the high throughput sequencing labs where I understand that library prep can be a very painful thing. And it's very important for a successful lab to, to have a good hand on how to do library prep. So we thought that it was really important to address that portion first uh, in this talk. So the way we're thinking about library prep really can be divided in two parts. Um, we are thinking about uh, the novo library prep and, and we work on that through existing partners, library prep companies, people and companies that you trust already. Um, and we will be supporting both PCR and PCR-free workflows, as well as index and non-index uh, protocols. Um, the, alternatives, the alternative is to do um, conversion uh, of existing libraries. And that is for people that are not comfortable with switching yet to a de novo approach for singular specific libraries and have existing libraries and they just want to try conversion. So that's just a PCR approach using specific primers that would make your existing libraries into, into singulars. Uh, there's two options. Um, I would say the option A is when uh, the user wants to keep the index information that we already have in the library. Uh, some, some people like their own indices or they don't want to make changes to that portion. Uh, so that would be the ideal uh, option for those. And then we have a second option, option B, where indexing information in the existing libraries is not important. Um, people don't care about those. They're okay with replacing those indices by new indices that we will be providing, or the, the libraries are not in this index at all. So, so that would be for, for that option. Um, so let's start with Denovo. Um, this is a good example of a de novo approach for library prep for the, for the G4. Uh, I'm sure you will see that this is uh, the typical library prep for NEB. So it's uh, it's based on ligation of the stem loop adapter. Um, I'm gonna put my laser pointer. It's just one second. So this library prep is of course based on ligation of these stem loop adapters. The loops are cleavable. And after cutting those adapters, one can do PCR to introduce the clustering tags. So it's only at this point that the library prep in this case becomes specific to singular. Um, and it becomes specific to singular because these primers have now these new tags at the very end, S1 and S2. These are the tags that we need for clustering in our system. The rest is identical to the majority of you would do today, um, the ligation and then the PCR. And the, the primers that I'm showing in this example are index primers. Again, we have a set of 96 UDIs, 12 base pair indices, but we have primers that are unindexed as well. So we, have, we can cater for, for everybody's uh, preference. Um, so the final product of this library prep is of course a linear double-stranded uh, library with all the known um, regions in the library with the clustering tags, two indices and the standard uh, sequencing primers that most of you would use, the sequencing primer one and sequencing primer two. In regards to conversion, again, going back to the option A, that is one uh, people like to keep their index information. We talk to a lot of potential customers and existing customers and discuss these aspects. Some people like their existing indices. And for those, we came up with a very simple approach of adding primers that bind to the current clustering tags. And those primers can be used to amplify those libraries and then add the new S1 and S2 tags that now can be used for, for clustering and sequencing. 
Um, these libraries are slightly longer than the original ones, but really doesn't make any effect on, on the clustering portion. Finally, the option B for conversion. In this case, we are catering for people that either don't have index libraries or don't care about the indices. They're okay with adding new indices, or maybe they don't want indices at all. Um, we have a second set of primers that now bind to the actual sequencing tags. So the sequencing primer one and sequencing primer two regions. And then they add um, the S1 and S2 tags along with indices, if that's the preference of the user. Once again, the final structure, double-stranded, linear. And in all of these cases, the novel by, by conversion, all these libraries are pretty straightforward. Um, they are QC the same way that you're using, you're, you're doing today for QC in your library. So sizing with fragment analyzer, um, and then quantifying with uh, a nanodrop or a qubit or any other method that you like. Of course, you can do PCR as well, but this is pretty straightforward and shouldn't be uh, too much of an issue to, to the conversion or the novel. All right, so moving on. Um, next, okay, how does the G4 look like? I mean, uh, Darius already showed a few images of the, the instrument. I wanted to remind you how it looks. For many of you, uh, size is important. This system is very similar to what you may have in your lab already, high seek, slightly smaller in every dimension compared to the, to the high seek, but it's the closest instrument that you can you know, have a comparison to. Um, the system has a large touch screen at the front, and then it has a couple, three compartments. Um, in these compartments, we have the, the, the cartridges for the sample, the SBS reagents, the flow cells, but I'm, I'm gonna go through that in, in a second in more detail. So what do you do when you start a run? So there's different ways that one can interact with the system. Um, we have a remote app that you could use from your office, set up a run and submit for sequencing, and then an operator in the lab can simply select the run, uh, add the reagents, the sample, and hit go. Um, you could also go straight, walk up to the instrument, and through the user, user interface on the screen, you can do everything as well. So I'm going to show the second example where we are just walking up to the instrument, stand up in front of the instrument, and what you see is this dashboard. In this dashboard, we have information, health information uh, of the system, like memory usage and many other things. Um, in the second section, we have... Um, uh, runs that are planned for the instrument, so runs that you may have submitted through the management app remotely. In this case, we have a run called RNA sequence. As you can see here by these symbols, it's a run that consists of two flow cells out of the four possible ones. Then you have um, the run format that you're planning for this run. In this case, it's an eight cycle index one, eight cycle index two, and a PRN two by 155. Um, also, you see the, that little green dot there that denotes the use of custom sequencing primers. The user can select that uh, if they have those type of uh, sequencing primers. And next to that, you have information about the, the sample sheet. So if the sample sheet was uploaded during run setup, it will be shown here. Uh, and that means that the, the, the data will be demultiplexed based on that sample sheet and fast queues will be uh, final, basically, the multiplexed and saved in the location of your choice. There's also some owner, run owner information and, and the scheduling information for the run. And below that, we have a third panel where we have previous results. Here we have all the runs that have gone through the system and one can click on, on these uh, rows and see high level information like Q scores, throughput and so on and so forth. So once the user is ready to set up the run, it's just as easy as clicking on this sequence section. Remember the screen is, is a touch screen, so just tapping there and the, and, the, and the software now opens the second window. This is the run definition uh, window. We simply add a run name. We can define if it's a single or a parent run. Uh, if it's a parent, like in this case, um, you can then add the values to the corresponding uh, read one, read two fields. It doesn't have to be symmetrical runs. In this case, it is, but it could be asymmetrical as well. And as I was saying before, we could select the use of custom uh, sequencing primers as well. Here we have information about the indices. We can, of course, skip index 
sequencing, or we can do single index or dual indices. In this case, we have selected dual ind indexing. So we can then write uh, the actual number of cycles that we want. As I said, our 96 uh, UDI set contains 12 base pair indices. So that's why we selected that. Uh, once this page is, is, is set up, uh, we can apply it to one, two, three, or four flow cells, as Darius mentioned earlier, and then simply hit next. And after hitting that uh, button, then the system guides you through the loading of the reagents, the consumables, the flow cells. So I'm not going to go through all that. The system has two modes, uh, an expert mode where we pretty much, the system pretty much indicates what reagents needs to load and one can quickly upload everything. And then it has a standard mode where there's animations walking you through step-by-step step all, all, all the necessary things that you need to do while you're loading those reagents. So again, I'm skipping that part, just showing the instrument again with the compartments open. And um, I'm gonna go one by one on what needs to be added and where. Uh, this is not the order that you actually use normally to, to start the run, but it's just easier because it's from top to bottom. So here we have in this top compartment, when you open it, you have slots for four sample cartridges. Um, you're gonna have one sample cartridge per flow cell to be sequenced. So it's a one-to-one -one for everything. Um, these cartridges have four slots, one per lane. So the user adds uh, the nature library on every position uh, of those four on, on the cartridge, and then inserts the cartridge into this slot. There's an EEPROM in that cartridge that has you know, a load number, expiration date, because there's some other reagents in that cartridge as well. Um, the system, of course, records all load information, expiration dates, uh, so then the user can evaluate later you know, if there was any issues and they can contact customer support in case problems occur. Uh, so that's four sample cartridges. Then the next step, we can have the SBS cartridges uh, inserted. Here are the, the, the drawing of those uh, cartridges. They're standard SBS cartridges. Um, here, one can add the custom sequencing primer. So there's slots uh, specific for this type of primer. Uh, otherwise, contains all the reagents for, for sequencing. And once again, there's one per flow cell position, so ma four maximum uh, number of cartridges. Next, at the very bottom, this is a drawer at the bottom of the system. Uh, you open this drawer and you have two areas. Um, to the left, we have the waste reservoir. This is a large reservoir that collects all the liquids that go through the system as the, as the system is going through sequencing. Um, Depending on the run formats, um, you know, it will be how often one needs to empty this, this reservoir. Um, the system will, will have an operational uh, weight sensor. It has an operational weight sensor that checks for volume. Uh, so if the user hasn't emptied the waste reservoir, it will warn um, that it needs to be emptied. And then to the right of this drawer, we have the four slots for wash buffer bottles. Um, again, one per position. All of these components, except the waste reservoir, have the EEPROM for recording load and expiration date information. And then finally, we have another compartment uh, for the flow cells. Uh, here is where we upload one, two, three, or four flow cells. Um, once all of these reagents on the flow cells are in the instrument, the instrument will do a quick health check to make sure that fluidics are okay, that memory is okay, and then one can start the run. Um, once the, the run started, one can monitor run progression. There's a, a new window that is shown on the main screen uh, that shows um, the, the, the setup, the configuration for each flow. So in this case, we have four little tabs, one per flow cell position. So position one, two, three, and four, the run configuration done for those positions. And then there's a progress bar that's shown in green that moves from clustering through sequencing to wash and demultiplexing. So this is a live progress bar that moves as the instrument is progressing from clustering to, to demultiplexing. In this case, we have the bar currently uh, in read number two at cycle 147, 150. So that's something that you know one can monitor if the run goes. And then, then at the bottom, we have this time elapsed um, or there's a clock 
that can show you when the run is going to finish, when it started, and when it's going to finish. And that's a live um, measure. So pretty straightforward. We were super excited about the, the instrument, the, the UI is very user-friendly, simple to set up. In a few minutes, one can get the, the, the run going even for four flow cells and, and um, 16 lanes. Now, what about data quality? Um, so I have a few slides covering read quality, uh, GC coverage, and then we're gonna move through some of the standard applications. I wanted to start first with um, whole human genome sequencing. Um, we have generated several data sets for whole human genome. These are generated on F2 flow cells. Uh, in this case, uh, we created a PCR free uh, library based on HG002 reference material. Um, we did this on a, on a G4, uh, as a two by 150 cycle format. And here I'm showing these two top panels, I'm showing the percent based calls at certain quality scores. And, and, and the idea here is to show that our um, reads are really high quality. In this case, for both read one and read two, we have more than 80% of the bases at Q30 or more. Um, our spec starts at 75, but we routinely get 80 to 85% basis uh, at Q30. Um, in regards to accuracy, in this case, we have nice accuracies at 99.8 and 99.9 for read one and read two respectively. So really nice performance overall. Um, and also another important metric, GC, GC coverage. So we have a really nice even um, coverage of GC content of the human genome. Here in these bottom panels, we have between 10% and 80% GC content. We have really flat lines for both reads one and read two. This is great to see. And we were, again, very happy with the general performance for whole human genome. At the end of the presentation, I have another slide talking about the performance for variant calling, German variant calling on, on whole human genome. Uh, we haven't done just human. Um, Obviously, the human sequencing is better suited for the F3 flow, so this was done on F2. We have done some other samples on F2, uh, like for example, bacterial whole genomes, and that's showing here uh, on the left-hand side of the slide. And we did bacterial simply because there's more variety of, of GC content in these organisms. So in these two plots, we are showing um, some sequencing that we did for this particular species, PHEP, at 42% GC, that's shown in the blue uh, color trace for both read one read two. Then E. coli in the black trace, uh, E. coli has approximately 51% GC. And then we did M. gruber. Uh, M. gruber is an organism with very high GC content at almost 64%, and that's shown in green. And we have simplified the plot. We have removed the very edges of the distribution because they get very few reads at that point and they're very noisy. So just to put all the information in one slide, uh, we've used all the buckets for the corresponding organism with reads um, of more than 0.01% of the totals. Again, just a way of tidying up these plots. But the main message is that the, the coverage is really even across the GC content for the corresponding organism. In regards to accuracy, still doing really well at more than 99.8% accuracy for both read one and read two. Um, moving on to, to whole exome uh, sequencing, we have done a lot of those samples. This is, this is coming from one of our uh, application notes. In here, we sequenced um, AG001 uh, using a quanta bio library prep and our stem loop adapters um, in a 2 by 150 cycle format. Once again, and this is a combined read one and read two trace for GC content. When, once again, we see a really nice even distribution uh, for the coverage across the, the territory that we're trying to, to cover. And this is an IDT XGen V2 exon panel. Um, this grace, it, sorry, this gray trace shows the, the fraction of reads um, for the corresponding uh, GC content. So most of the reads for this panel are within you know, 30 to 70% GC. And in that area, we do really well. So that's for read quality accuracy and GC coverage. So we're pretty pleased with what we've seen so far in some major applications. So I wanted to move on uh, and start talking about index and index validation and, and some information about uh, index hopping. So this data comes from our index validation uh, work. Uh, we generated 
96 unique Salmonella whole genome libraries, um, each library with a unique UDI combo for index one and index two. Um, these libraries were run on the G4, of course, in sets of 24. I mean, it was easy to run uh, four sets of 24 covering all combos from uh, combo one through 96, 24 per lane. Uh, and that's what's shown on these plots. So on the x-axis, we have the barcode number, again, from one through 96 for the index one read. And on the y-axis, we have the barcode number for the index two read. And what we are doing here is to, to, to do this correlation. We expect to have, of course, matched reads uh, since you know each combo is paired. We expect to have a signal for barcode one for read one and barcode one in, in index two read. Um, so the diagonal is expected to be very bright. This is a heat map. Uh, anything outside of the diagonal speaks of sample crosstalk uh, or index hopping. Um, you know, so the, the, the measurement of that crosstalk um, in this particular case resulted in 0.07% uh, index hopping, which is very low, but we routinely see um, numbers below 0.1%, which is pretty good uh, compared to what you can see in you know, available data sets. Um, and of course, that depends on many things, for example, the purity of the, of the primers used uh, for PCR. So really nice and low uh, index hopping events or sample crosstalk events. In regards to the multiplexing, uh, we're seeing routinely more than 98% of the multiplexing. These are, again, our own singular genomics uh, primers. Um, and a reminder that these uh, primers contain 12 base pair barcodes that can be sequenced also as eight. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of differences within those barcodes, so they work as well uh, as eight base pair reads. Um, next, um, let me move this. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about low diversity libraries and the performance that we see uh, on this type of materials. So, now moving forward, there. Um, so, we have done some internal testing with methylation uh, sequencing libraries. Um, these are libraries that are normally seen as low diversity. Um, we have done PhiX. Uh, titrations into these, these libraries. These are EM seq libraries from NEB in this particular case. Um, and as you can see from, the, from this plot, we, we don't see an effect on quality uh, percent basis at more than Q30 um, as phi x increases. So there's really no need for in, including phi x when we sequence these type of libraries on the G4. We have seen other examples too, for example, single indexed libraries uh, sequence on the G4 doing index reads specifically. There's one index sequence. Quality is really good. The multiplexing is really good. So we, we, we know that we don't have a sensitivity to uh, low color diversity for base calling. And this is a nice example that shows um, that we don't need you know, to increase that color balance by spiking in phi x. The product will have uh, a phi x tube uh, that users can use. So this, this library has, has been made with S1, S2 clustering tags. So we can keep doing what you do currently with your systems and have an internal control for, for example, measuring error rate. But it's really not needed for color balance. We have another nice example from, a, from, an, from an external partner. This is uh, work done through our early access program. In this case, we had um, this, this company working on CFDNA. They have a custom library prep um, for prepping and sequencing CFDNA. And this library prep results on having an A at position 22 in the read one um, insert. So when they compare, and this is standard for them, this is what they see when they sequence on, on Illumina, I think on the next seek, they see that at, at position 22 on this read one, Quality drops dramatically to under Q20 um, because of this uh, absence of color balance. It's basically, everything comes up as a single base. Uh, in our system, shown here in the blue trace, there's no effect uh, on the quality uh, of the base and the read at this position, simply because, again, we don't have a sensitivity towards low 
color diversity. So it's just another example. So we are pretty confident on that uh, performance and we're happy to see that uh, we do pretty well here. Now, uh, let's go through some of the common applications and some of the performance that we see for these common applications. I'm not gonna describe this table again. This is something that Darius already covered. Um, I'm just going to have it as a guide for what application we're going to talk about. And we will start with this uh, RNA-seq, bulk RNA-seq application. We have done a lot of sequencing for RNA-seq. You know, makes sense to do RNA-seq on this system. It's a perfect system for uh, this type of, uh, of library format. Um, in this case, um, the study design, uh, we took human, uh, human UHR. Uh, from in vitro gen, and we prepped it with an NEB Next library prep kit. Uh, we did poly A selection um, for mRNA, and then we did amplification with either control primers provided in the kit or with our own singular genomic specific primers. Um, all these preps were spiked in with DRCC as controls. Uh, and then we sequenced, of course, the singular genomics one on our G4 on the F2 flow cell. Um, on, on replica flow cells. And we were targeting 25 million reads for, for analysis. Um, the root configuration in this case was a PRN 2 by 100. We did dual indices because uh, we run different samples, not just the UHR replicates here. Um, but after the multiplexing for these two reps, we got more than 25 million, 37 in one case, 55 million for the other. The difference is we're not due to seeding, but simply differences on the pooling level that we did. So this rep one was pulled uh, with more samples than the, the rep two in a, in a different flow cell. In both, both cases, we got really good percent base at Q30 for read one and read two, uh, above 85, 85% again, our spec is 75% or more. Um, looking at ERCC, the control that we spiked in during library prep, um, we see really nice correlations between the observed uh, counts and expected counts um, in, in log scale, uh, you know, with R squares of 0.91, uh, and that is for both replicates from two different flow cells. So again, really nice uh, correlation, suggests that we have very little to no biases on, on the sequences of these uh, synth synthetic transcripts. Um, we also looked at the correlation of the actual transcripts uh, between the two reps. And as you can see here in this plot, we get you know, an R square of 0.99. So really, really nice and, and clean correlation. Um, we did send one of the libraries uh, to sequence on an external um, service provider uh, doing NextSeq. Um, so here we are showing the comparison of our data to that particular data set. In this plot is the correlation between uh, the counts seen on the, on the Illumina system versus what we saw on the G4 for the corresponding rep uh, with R squares at 0.986. So really nice, uh, very comparable results. We also were interested in looking at the gene body coverage uniformity to make sure there's no differences in the way we cover these transcripts. Um, the data is shown in blue and gray. So blue for the G4, gray for Illumina, there's really no differences, we have a perfect overlap of the traces, again, suggesting no biases, no differences between the Illumina run and the G4 run. And then we have a comparison of um, gene counts, a number of genes detected between the G4 and the Illumina run. This is in transcripts per million, higher than 10 or higher than, higher than 100, literally the same uh, result. Again, everything was down sampled to 25 million, so it's an apples to apples comparison. Uh, we also looked at the redistribution uh, across the transcript tone. Uh, we pretty much get identical representation of the different regions. So once again, we are very comfortable with the data we're seeing, uh, very comparable data to, to what you probably are used to seeing in your own systems in your labs. Now, um, what about single cell RNA-seq is another one, of, another one of those applications that we think is gonna be perfect for, for the G4. Uh, so a lot of people are interested in doing single cell on the G4. So we did a specific study to show how it works. Um, in this case, uh, we took human PVMCs, frozen PVMCs. We 
start, we created a few uh, replicates. Uh, we did amplifications with control primers or single genomic specific primers. Uh, and of course, using the Tenex genomics chromium system and the single cell three prime uh, kit for that. The, the experiment consisted of targeting approximately 7,000 cells, I think on the user guide from Tenex. The recommended number is 10,000 um, and using 20,000 reads per cell uh, for analysis. We just targeted 7,000 because it fits nicely with the throughput of an F2 flow cell, which is 150 million with 7,000 or 20,000 reads per cell, so approximately 140 million. So it should have been a nice example. Uh, of course, the, the libraries were sequenced on the G4 on, on the F2 um, configuration. So what about the, the, the format? Of course, following 10x recommendation, we do a 24, 28 base pair read one, 91 read two. Uh, the throughput that we obtain, um, and by the way, these are technical replicates. So the same library seeded across two different flow cells. We're comparing the two flow cells. The throughput obtained for each flow cell, much higher than our spec of 150 million. Here, 180 and 191 million reads. Um, and then at high level, um, cell ranger results look very comparable between the two uh, technical replicates. We ended up capturing closer to 9,000 cells, but with the throughput that we obtained, we were able to, to really get to the 20,000 reads per cell, which is you know, the recommended number from, from 10X. All the, the metrics are really comparable uh, across the two replicates. So there were no, no red flags or anything to, to note. Uh, we did look at pseudo polycarbonate seq analysis on the, on the results. This is showing the correlation for gene expression between replicate one and replicate two. As you can see, it's super tight correlation, 0.99. Um, also looked at the correlation between the expression on the seen on the G4 versus the next 2000. Again, nice correlation. Remember, these are different libraries with different, made with different primers sent to two different places for sequencing. So all in all, really nice correlation. Um, and then we moved on to doing a UMAP uh, dimension reduction on the combined data sets. Um, and we see you know, very comparable embeddings across the two platforms and very similar distributions for T cells, monocytes, B cells, at least as inferred by, by the corresponding gene markers. CD3D here for T cells, CD14 for monocytes, and MS4A1 for, for B cells. Uh, we did go one step further also in with this uh, data set. Um, uh, we did unsupervised clustering uh, of the data um, and then did cell type annotation using uh, cell typist. And you, we actually looked at this number, the adjusted run index. Um, I'm told that this is a number uh, to assess how similar to clustering data look like, uh, how similar they are. The higher the number, the better. Uh, and for clustering and annotation, we got 0.98 and 0.99. So suggesting that these data sets really are pretty much identical, uh, which we are very excited about. And uh, we also saw really nice um, comparable lineage marker expression for, for the PBMC components. So once again, uh, no red flags, really nice performance, very comparable to what you, you would see on an XSIG 2000. Now I'm gonna move quickly, I don't know how I'm doing this time, but I'm gonna move quickly through exome and whole, whole genome sequencing. In this case, uh, I have shown already some uh, data regarding GC coverage um, and, and, and read quality. So now I'm gonna concentrate on uh, germline variant calling. So starting with exome, um, for this study, we generated a, a library, whole genome library based on HG001, um, followed by whole exome capture using IDT, uh, exogen kit. Uh, and then we did the deep variant, um, we, we did the variant calling using deep variant 1.3 um, with either the standard out of the box model from Illumina, trained on Illumina, or our model specific to singular genomics trained on a different set of standards, AG002 through AG006. As you can see, the performance with a singular model is much better than the one coming out of the box. That's not unexpected. Um, we see really nice uh, accuracy for, for SNP and Indel calling. Um, and it's really within 
uh, what we see in, in the field with uh, data sets available for other platforms. Um, the, the, the singular genomic specific model will be available uh, deployed on NVIDIA Parabricks and deployed by, by Google. So it will be available in the future. I know I'm running out of time. So I wanna move quickly to the whole genome. Um, similar story, made a PCR-free library based on AG002. Uh, this is a very recent data set, sequence of the 2 by 150 on the G4 targeting 31X coverage. Once again, used deep variant. Now the latest version of this variant caller 1.4 deployed on NVIDIA Parabricks. Uh, we saw really nice performance. This is higher than what we published previously on our technical report with one that you guys can download from our website. We're very happy with this performance again, um, within range of what's publicly available for other data sets externally. Um, we have really low duplication rate at 4%, very low optical duplication rate at 0.29%. It's so again, great, great data, um, but I'll let you be the judges. Um, do I have time for this slide, Darius? Uh, maybe one, one minute. Okay, so super quickly, these are kind of forward-looking slides uh, showing products that are in development and things that we're gonna be launching in the future. We have two super cool technologies, one HDSeq and another one called MaxReads. HDSeq is something that we came up with for high accuracy sequencing, probably for rare variant, rare variant detection. This is something that is based on specific library prep uh, the concept here is to link the two original strands on a piece of DNA such that the, the strands get uh, together throughout the process, library prep and sequencing. And, and what I'm showing here, this is the, the way one sequences these this libraries on the G4. The two strands are linked, the two reads overlap, so read one sequences one side, read two sequences the other side. And that way we can compare top and bottom and discern what's a real variant from an error. And that leads to really high accuracy that we think is gonna be important for these rare variant detection applications. Max reads, uh, super cool, very high throughput, uh, low cost, um, you know, up to 4 billion reads uh, on the same F2 flow cell that we use to today that produces 150 million each. Um, the concept here is to maximize the, the use of the real state available on these flow cells. So normally one thinks of these clusters on, on, on a pattern array as, you know, if it's not a monoclonal cluster, it gets discarded. In this case, we can actually make use of all the space on the flow cell and we can actually share our cluster between multiple library families. The key is to have different sequencing primers for each subfamily. Um, so now when we do sequential sequencing for each of those sequencing prime with those sequencing primers, we can actually look at the same cluster, um, but different regions within, within the same cluster. And we have really nice proof concept data showing RNA-seq results reaching 1 billion reads per flow. So with that, I'm finishing. Sorry for, for being a little late, but um, we're super excited about it. Thank you. Any questions? Well, thank you both very much. I know Darius has been addressing questions in the chat, which is terrific. Um, and thank you all, everyone for joining us today. And thanks especially to our speakers and presenters from Singular. Uh, and as they said earlier, we will share the recording of today's session uh, to everyone um, within the next 24 hours. And it'll be linked on the ABRF website along with the, present, the recordings of the presentations from the other parts of the seminar series, uh, which has its final program next week, uh, same time, same day, um, featuring uh, Ultimate Genetics. So. Thank you all. Thank you, Anoja, for organizing the program, and I hope everyone has a great day. Darius, I'm going to uh, share your contact information with some of the um, attendees who ask questions so that you can follow up. Excellent. And, and we will also be following up directly, too, uh, to make sure all the questions uh, that you guys asked today are addressed. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.